This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have an extra special guest. What can I say about Julian Salisbury? He is the Chief Investment Officer of Asset and Wealth Management at Goldman Sachs. He's a member of the Management Committee. He co-chairs a number of the Asset Management Investment Committees. Uh, He covers PE, infrastructure, growth equity, credit, real estate, on and on. Really a fascinating person who has seen the world from a unique perspective in, in multiple cities as an investor. He's been with Goldman for 25 years and helps oversee over two and a half trillion dollars in assets under supervision. I thought this was an absolutely fascinating way to see the world of investment management. uh, And I found this conversation to be fascinating. And I think you will also. With no further ado, my discussion with Goldman Sachs, Julian Salisbury. Welcome to Bloomberg. Thanks, Barry. It's great to be here. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Let, let's start out with a little bit of your background. You begin in audit practice at KPMG. What what was the original career plan? Honestly, um, I, I didn't really have a long-term plan. I grew up in a family where my mother was a mathematician, my father was a chemist. I didn't really know much about the world of finance. Um, investment banks were not really a known concept in the area I grew up. I graduated college, realized I need to needed to get a job. And my dad had always said, as you know, many young kids get this advice, doctor, a lawyer, accountant, engineer, sure. and accountant seemed like a, a reasonable option. And I, I kind of stumbled my way into accounting. And uh, what I found was it was, it was just a phenomenal training ground for somebody who wants to then go on to invest um, in, in especially doing more micro level uh, uh, analysis like that background of being a, an accountant was just was just great bedrock training very precise very yeah. specific so yeah. so how do you then go from tax and audit practice to finance and investing, very different fields. Yeah, I'd love to tell you there was some great master plan, but uh, you know, in the UK, you uh, when you qualify as a, as a chartered accountant, first of all, you have to complete your three years training. So mm-hmm. you know, people these days want to change job after a year, 18 months, you, know, you had to finish the three years. I, I finished the three years, I qualified the following week. I lined up a bunch of job interviews with a variety of banks. And again, I I'd ended up in the uh, financial services audit practice at KPMG. So I'd got to know banks a little bit. And frankly, you know, I heard they pay more. So I uh, mm-hmm. I interviewed with a bunch of banks, got a got a number of job offers by the end of the week and, and joined Goldman Sachs in, um, in October 1998. So let me throw one of your own quotes back at you because I, I feel like it's so revealing. Mm-hmm. Quote, the world of finance isn't as complicated as newcomers expect. It's simply shrouded in techno jargon. Explain what you mean there. It's, I continue to find this true to this day. But when I first joined the firm, um, I was doing P&L and risk reporting for a credit trading desk. And people start talking about DVO on this and duration right. that, jump to default this, futures versus cash. I didn't know what any of these terms meant. So I took it upon myself to go off and took a course in bond math, I took another course in derivatives, and realized the underlying fundamental concepts were barely, I mean, it wasn't even high school math in most cases. But And it was really more about learning um, not a different language, but a different dialect. And it's interesting because you'll oh. find people who'll be fluent in one dialect and then, you know, they, they become fluent in credit dialect. And then and then you talk to somebody who works in an equities business and they start throwing Greeks at you and you, you, you've never come across these terms. Again, it sounds highly complicated. Most people, you could sit them down in half an hour and explain, you know, the majority of the concepts. That, that's been kind of true in a lot of professions over history. Yeah is that almost by design, their language keeps outsiders at arm's distance. Yep. And hey, if you want to learn our secrets, you have to pay us. Yep. Are you suggesting that all of this techno jargon is just to create a little mystique around um, the wizards of finance? I, I, I wouldn't say that's entirely it. But what you find, it, I mean, and this becomes more and more true, I think, is people become very specialized. In order mm-hmm. to compete and win in so many things today in finance, you have to be super specialized. So you find people who are super deep in one area, one narrow area, and it might be it might be investment grade credit or distress credit. It might be equity derivatives. Uh, it might be growth equity. And, and they all develop their own little 
system of useful terms, but then they end up becoming almost like um, a barrier that makes it hard for an outsider who hasn't grown up in the world of finance, who doesn't have, you know, a father who ran a hedge fund or an uncle who ran a private equity firm. It's hard for them to break in without some way of d- developing that that jargon. So that shorthand works for the practitioners. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's no malif- m- malicious intent there. It's just, hey, that's how these people talk in their chosen sure. specialty. Yeah, it's, huh. it's quite natural. Huh. Really interesting. So you mentioned uh, you joined Goldman Sachs in 1998, coming up on your 25th anniversary. Congratulations. Yep. Thank that's, you. That's pretty good. Uh, heady times in 98. What's kept you at Goldman for for 25 years? Look, I, I think, um, you know, first of all, it's, it's the people, just super high quality people across the business, um, no matter what part of the firm they operate in. Just the average uh, um, intensity level, uh, in- integrity level, capabilities. Um, I mean, it's just really hard to match when you when you go to other organizations. So people is a huge part of it. Another part of it is I, I've been lucky in that I've, you know, although I've been in one firm for 25 years, I've just done so many radically different things. You've been um, in a lot of different divisions. You've yep. had a lot of different job descriptions. Yeah, I, I've been in, uh, I think, all but one division at this point. Um, and I've worked in three different offices, two continents. Um, I would say it's been a little more evolutionary um, after the first five or six years. But that that ability to constantly be learning um, and at times be quite entrepreneurial in terms of starting new businesses. So what I tend to find is after three or four years, it it depends how big and complicated the task is, but after, in some cases, it might be two years. In other cases, it may take a little longer, three, four years. You know, you start to think what's next. You know, you develop reps. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are hard to start with. And then it's like, I, I love sports analogies. It's like lifting weights. At some point, you have to start changing the exercise or increasing the weights. Right. Otherwise, you stop developing and learning. Um, and sometimes it's a change, uh, and then you can go back to what you were doing before, and you and you come back and you've benefited from that cross training. But it's um, it, it's the ability to constantly learn and keep adapting. So you mentioned a couple of continents. Mm-hmm. You've worked in London and Moscow and now New York. How have your roles changed in each of those locations and, and what do you learn working in very different parts of the world? Yeah. So I, I joined, as I said, in 98, and I was doing P&L and risk reporting for the investment grade trading desk and then the high yield desk. I ended up being hired onto the high yield desk as a, as a research analyst and did that mm-hmm. for a number of years, uh, a couple of years. And then I was the beneficiary of the TMT bubble bursting in 2001. So the, the whole sector that I was covering went bankrupt. So I went from being a publishing high yield research analyst to uh, a distressed debt analyst and an investor. Same companies, just same from, companies. Yeah, they just became yeah. distressed. Yeah. The high yield bonds quickly <laughs> went to zero, and then you're buying the bank loans at discounted prices. So. Um, and that was a uh, that was fairly uh, evolutionary, and then in uh, in about two thousand and three, we um, set up a group called the European Special Situations Group, which was a multi asset class proprietary investing business. It was centered around credit, but really invested in both credit, real estate, growth equity. I led the corporate research team there for a few years, and then um, you know, in a fit of madness, I guess at the end of oh six, um, you know, the credit markets were pretty uninteresting. There wasn't a lot to do. It was kind of bad companies issuing mm-hmm. uh, low quality bonds. And uh, I thought about, you know, what's next? I actually went out to visit the team in Asia and thought about moving out there. And uh, my, my wife happens to be um, Russian or Belarusian. So I had an, an interest in the, in the Russian market. And around that time, Russia was starting to open up a little bit. It was mm-hmm. a very different place that we find ourselves today. They were starting to want to attract international capital. Um, and I, I did a couple of trips out there, and the next thing I know, my boss is buying me a one-way ticket to, to Moscow. Uh, so I spent the next couple of years there. And the role there was quite different. It was really building a growth equity business, and we had some great successes, not backing oil and gas companies or formerly state-owned assets. It was really finding growth equity companies, young entrepreneurs that were building businesses. I did that for a couple of years, and then I um, I moved back to London at the end of 08, which was a really interesting Good pivot. timing. Yeah. yeah, I was asked to come back to lead the uh, the European business. Which you know, talk about buying at the bottom. You know, at the end of '08, we owned a lot of uh, illiquid assets, and whilst on a relative basis, um, you know, those assets outperformed what was going on in a lot of other private firms. 
you know, it was certainly, uh, I think we had 169 positions on the book at the time, and there was a problem with 168 of them at the end of 08. <laughs> that was kind of like a, you know, uh, a, 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 almost like a distressed uh, buy at the bottom uh, assignment. What was interesting about that was the quick need to both separate the portfolio between the old stuff and the new stuff, because there mm-hmm. were a lot of new investment opportunities. And if people were too burdened down by dealing with legacy situations, they couldn't really focus on the new opportunities. And frankly, you had to do with the same with the people. I, I think that was a proposal from one of the central bankers. We need a bad bank and a good bank. You yeah. you inherit a whole bunch of positions that have come through the financial yeah. crisis. Yeah. You really want to look at this as, hey, here's the legacy stuff that yeah. comes with a little hair on it, yeah. and here's our opportunistic, hey, look at all this stuff that we yeah. have no exposure. What, what, what was the financial crisis like when you were in London? How, how mm. in the U.S., it mm. was sheer mayhem. What oh, was it like over there? No, absolutely. I mean, it was it was an existential event. I mean, people were wondering, am I going to have a job? It was the year I made partner, actually, in 2008. And I thought, great, I just made partner. Is, is this group, is this business <laughs> going to exist by the end of the year? So it was certainly stressful. Uh, but in some ways, it, those events, and we saw it again in March of 2020, we saw it again, you know, around, uh, you know, we, we see these big moments where it, it draws people together. So mm-hmm. actually, everybody gets... You know, any kind of nonsense and couch time all dissipates because everyone's so focused on dealing with a task at hand. So in that ways, it was quite a good defining moment. The other thing I would say is I, I, I in some ways it was I remember a few years earlier, there was one investment that I was working on that ended up being spectacularly successful. But there was a period of time where I was quite worried that it was going to lose a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And the reason I was worried is it was it was my position. It was me and and, and the rest of the world was looking good. The thing in uh, oh, wait, everything was broken and bad. Right. So that actually helped in a way that everybody was dealing with the same broad-based crisis as mm-hmm. opposed to when it's just you or just your firm or just your fund, uh, where, where in, in some ways it can feel more more stressful. So what brought you back to New York and, and what year was that? So I, uh, so I led the European Special Situations Group from 08 to 2013. Mm-hmm. And then at that time, I was asked to run the, the global business. And it seemed pretty natural uh, to, to move to the US at that time. There were a couple of reasons for that. One, the London market is where I'd spent most of my career. I knew the market, but I also knew the people there. I was very well calibrated at a very a strong and, and, uh, and trusted team, um, the vast majority of which are still uh, with the business today. So I felt like that was the last place I needed to be. So mm-hmm. then it was a question of Asia or, or, or the US. If I'd moved to Hong Kong, I think it would have looked like a fairly self-serving tax trade. Um, <laughs> if, if I had done that, it would have been because I thought that was one of the more interesting markets at the time where there was real alpha generating capabilities. So, but, so you said, let's find the most expensive taxable city in yeah, the world. Yeah. No, what I, what I decided is do what's right for the business. And what okay. was best for the business at the time was to be in New York, where it's a New York headquartered firm. It's a, mm-hmm. new, it's, a, it's a US centric firm. I think that's fairly well understood. And at the time, we were going through a lot of regulatory change. Mm-hmm. Capital rules were changing. Risk appetite was changing. And being at headquarters where you could stay close to the the people, you know, whether it's head of compliance, head of legal, head of risk, um, some whoever was running the business needed to be close to those decision makers in order to shepherd the business through that post financial crisis period where there was a lot of, you know, the the, the Volcker rule like brought into uh, focus, you know, could we do these businesses? Could you run uh, private equity business? Could you run distressed credit businesses? So we really had to work through that over over a number of years. And that, that's what really brought me to the US. Uh, and I, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of New York before I moved here. But now it's it's hurt. We've been here almost 10 years. We, we love it. And I, you know, I can't imagine leaving. Tell us a little bit about what the Goldman Sachs asset and wealth management business is like. What do they focus on? Sure. Well, at, at the simplest level, we, we manage money for our clients, about $2.7 trillion of assets today, three main client segments, institutional clients, Mm -hmm. our own uh, private wealth clients, and then third-party wealth clients where we manage money on behalf of other uh, uh, wealth managers, distribution partners. So those are the three main segments. Within institutional, we manage money on behalf of pensions, endowments, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds. So that's essentially what we what we do from a, from a client segmentation perspective, and we do that globally: U.S., Europe, and Asia. Uh, in terms of the 
uh, from the from the investing side of the business, we really are uh, somewhat unique uh, in that we cover the full range of products uh, from meaning the most, both public and and alternatives. Uh, yes, and and really even within that, the full range. So everything from money market funds, core fixed income, high yield fundamental equity, quant equity, and then the full range of alternatives, both direct and indirect. Uh, We have a business where we invest in other people's private equity funds, private credit funds, and then we have a series of direct investment strategies, private equity, growth equity, credit, real estate, uh, infrastructure, sustainability, life sciences. So when we, what we find, and then of course we have a a multi-asset solutions business where we talk to clients about the entirety of their portfolio, uh, their strategic asset allocation models. So what we find is with our, with our clients increasingly, they don't want to just be pitched on a product or pitched on a single idea. It's like, what do I do? How do I uh, address my needs? What are my liability structures? How do I make long-term investment decisions? Um, and then how do I execute upon that overall advice through these individual investment uh, opportunities? So that sounds like a substantial menu of options that yep. can be fairly customized for each individual client, regardless, yep. family office, high net worth individual, yep. or one of the institutions. Yep. Take us through a little bit of what that process is like, because I have to assume it's not cookie cutter. If you're dealing with a sovereign wealth fund, that's mm. a very different conversation yeah. than than a family office. Look, every client is different. They have a different liability structure, different investment goals, different investment uh, risk tolerances, and we have different teams. Uh, we have an institutional client team. We have private wealth advisors that cover our own uh, uh, clients directly, and then we have a series of uh, people that cover the the distribution partners. So it, it's it's pretty bespoke and tailored to their individual needs. And yes, some. Um, demand and expect a higher level of customization and a higher level of service. If somebody's you know, giving us billions of dollars, then they they expect a very high level of customization. Um, at, the, at the simpler end, it, it can be a relatively plain vanilla product. But I would say even our private wealth, smaller private wealth clients uh, are increasingly looking for a um, broader set of advice and customization in terms of how we design their portfolio, which could be implementing um, values that they have or tilts that they have a desire mm-hmm. to include or in- exclude certain products uh, or uh, QCIPs within their within their equity portfolio or fixed income portfolio. Hmm. Re- really intriguing. So, so your chief in- investment officer mm-hmm. of asset and wealth management. That sounds like there's a pretty big. Um, list of, of responsibilities mm. under that. Mm. So not only are you describing the broader asset allocation mm-hmm. decisions with yeah. various clients, yeah. you're also selecting the specific assets that go within mm. each of those allocations. Yeah. Is that is that more or less yeah. right? So we have we have different teams that do this. So we have our our, our MAS team, our multi asset solutions team, who are really providing more of the overall portfolio advice. And that's that's a discrete skill set um, mm-hmm. for doing that. And then we have investment teams in each of these areas. So we have specialists uh, in each of the sectors uh, that I set out for you. I'm responsible for each of these individual investment teams, making sure we have the right players on the field, the right processes in place. And then as it relates to the private side um, activities, I, I co-chair all of those investment committees. So the individual deals that are coming through in our private equity business and our growth equity business and our real estate business. So we have, you know, I'm one person. My primary responsibility at the end of the day is to make sure that we have the right people on the mm-hmm. field uh you know, fulfilling each of these uh, roles and functions. You're the coach, and you're sending different players in to yeah. do to do different jobs. Yeah. So your background, you've worked at merchant banking, you've worked in special situations. Yeah. How does all of that come into play as as chief investment officer? Yeah, it, it's interesting because some some of it's helpful and useful, and then sometimes it can be it can burden you. You know, when I ran the special situations group, it was a pure investing business. We didn't really have clients. We didn't really have to worry about marketing or advertising. Didn't spend time on podcasts or TV. Right. We kept everything as quiet as possible, and a hundred percent of the focus was just finding interesting investments that we generated the highest return on equity possible for the firm. There wouldn't be a dollar of risk that we would deploy that I wouldn't personally review. Uh, We'd have a couple of hundred deals a year coming through investment committee. And that was interesting, and it was a great model while it lasted. But I would say that the the industry changed, the regulatory environment changed. And and also, I used to sit back and think, this is great. You know, we just get to focus on assets and asset risk management. I don't have to worry about 
flying around the world collecting capital from from LPs. We have one LP, and it's the, it's the firm. It's Goldman Sachs, and they're in the same building. The problem is, um, you know, there, there, there are multiple problems with that. But one is you miss out on a huge information piece, which is understanding what these huge asset allocators and investors want and understanding what their liability structures are and what their needs are from an investment perspective really informs your view on the forward path of asset prices. Um, and then you know, I would also say we were seeing increasing need from our clients to increase allocations to alternatives. And we were doing a lot of this for ourselves, but we didn't have enough uh, investment product to be able to offer to our clients and scale and grow the business. So it, it was a very natural evolution to take a series of businesses which have been prosecuted either wholly on balance sheet or to a large extent on balance sheet and start to evolve that business model where we continue to commit our own capital and our partner's capital, but to bring in client money alongside us. So you you touch on so many fascinating areas. I, I have to follow up um, at least with, with three of them. One is you mentioned clients' wants. Yep. How do you separate when clients want something from when clients need something and then lastly, from when, hey, all these clients are all clamoring for the same asset class, maybe this has had a little bit of a good run and it's time to think about leaning the other way. How, how do you juggle all of those? Look, our, our job as an advisor to our clients is to know them intimately, to understand them, to understand their um, their funding structure or their liability structure, to understand their risk tolerance, to um, understand their investment philosophy and approach, and then really to bring to them a variety of solutions. Um, we have uh, a, a team that um, really looks at their portfolio holistically across all asset classes. And then we have individual teams that can help bring implementation uh, in each of the individual asset classes to make up that overall portfolio. But it's really a solutions-oriented approach and a very client-centric approach. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned liability. Mm. I, I want to discuss that because I think the layperson who hears this yeah. may not understand. When sure. we're talking about financial liabilities, yeah. what we're really talking about is, hey, we have a bunch people retiring in 10 years and we expect to have to pay out x dollars mm -hmm. uh, go into a little yeah. bit of what those liabilities are yeah. not yeah, yeah. you know the mm. the usual use of, of the yeah. word sorry when, when i say that i mean uh, by the way asset liability little jargon little techno uh, yeah, jargon yeah exactly <laughs> people should be uh, if, if people had forgotten about asset liability mismatches they got mm -hmm. the starkest reminder of it possible with the collapse of svb a For couple sure. of weeks ago Generally, it's asset liability mismatches that causes, uh, the, you know, the bank you know, bank failures, but it also causes, in some cases, hedge fund failures and, and other financial institutions to fail. So what I mean by that is, what is your source of funding? Mm -hmm. If you're uh, a, an individual investor, for example, um, your uh, your your source of you don't have to give that money back. It's your money, so you may be able to afford to tie it up as long as you've kept enough money aside to meet your near term liquidity needs. You know your your cost of living essentially. If you have a private equity fund where you've raised money from institutional clients, they they have given you that money for ten years. Often some some cases it could be longer. So you have time to invest that money, generate a return on that money, and give the money back. If you have hedge fund money, you may have to give that money at a month or three months notice. So you have to be very careful about how long you lock up your investments mm -hmm. for. Uh, and if your source of funding is overnight deposits that can be uh, called uh, on <laughs> that are on demand, then you have very, very short liability. So what I mean by that is first understand the duration of your funding source. That's what I mean by liabilities. Insurance companies have very long dated capital. Um, uh, pension funds have quite long dated capital. It tends to be quite sticky. Um, so first, it's understand the the duration of those of that funding source, and then the second is understand the the, the return requirement of that funding source. So, for example, a lot of pensions and endowments would tell you in order to meet my obligations to pay pensioners for the next few years, I need to generate on average a seven percent return on that portfolio. Okay, and if I do more, that's that's good. But I, you know, in extremis, I should want to achieve a seven percent return and take as little risk as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so um, then they have to look at what's my what's my mix and how does each investment that I make uh, help me achieve that that goal. So it's it's really understanding um, 
funding source duration, funding source return requirement, and then for certain types of fan financial institutions, understanding the capital rules. So for example, if we raise, uh, if we invest money for an insurance company, how we structure that can make a difference to the amount of capital they have to hold against it. So it, it's our job to to better understand these. Of course, you know the best funding source is to just have lots and lots and lots of your own money right. with no particular time horizon on which you give it back, no particular capital rules that you have to comply with, no compli you know, no clients to actually have to answer to. Um, but you know, most people don't have the luxury of having that much money. Infinite perpetual capital is the ideal circumstance. Absolutely. And if Absolutely. only you could do that. So earlier we were talking about assets, and then you referenced risk management. Yep. Tell, tell us a little yep. bit about the difference between yep. managing risk and, and merely owning assets. Well, look, I, I would say whenever you um, are making investment recommendations to your, your clients, you have to think about a range of potential outcomes. Of course, there's a base case outcome for most investments that you might make. If you invest in a bond, the base case would typically be that it pays a coupon until maturity and then redeems at par. It might not be a straight path between when you buy it and when you uh, get redeemed. But that's a general expectation. There's a, there's a general expectation in the markets that if you hold equities long enough, they'll generally go up in price. Again, it may not be a straight line. Um, similarly, when you buy private assets, um, there's a general expectation that these things will accrete in value. Um, but what you have to really do for each client is help them understand what's the risk the deviation that could occur around that base case. And sometimes people become relatively blasé or um, they, they kind of um, fall into this um, mode of thinking um, th there's only ever going to be a tight range of outcomes and they don't think about the extreme events. What could happen in a more stream? Could I survive an extreme set of circumstances? So mm -hmm. a great example, you know, some of these things you can plan for and some you can't. Like, so for example, it, it was probably unreasonable in March of 2020, that companies would have a war chest, a, a hotel company would have a war chest that would see them manage through 12 months of zero revenues based right. on the global pandemic. So there are some things that you can't, but there are a lot of things that you can. Um, on the flip side, for. the the airlines had a couple of weeks runway. Yeah, turns out not to be enough. Yeah, exactly. So, but there there are certainly things you could prepare for. So. Um, can I withstand uh, an equity drawdown? Do I have the liquidity available to meet my ongoing cash flow obligations, even in the event of a drawdown? And then, and then you see some surprise events. So uh, it, it was kind of interesting. We've seen a couple of these uh, events now. Um, one, you know, when people have asked me to compare and contrast today versus two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. you know, what you hear from a lot of people is, yes, there's some fairly heady valuations, some, there was some fairly aggressive kind of investment uh, um, strategies being pursued. But I would say generally, there's less leverage in the system. The banks, the large banks at least, are better capitalized. You have fewer hedge funds making long dated liquid investments with three month capital. Mm -hmm. There's just generally more duration in the liability structure so that people can withstand a storm. And then you see the events of September of last year, where the UK pensions many of the UK pension plans had a very short-term liquidity crisis because they would uh, they basically had a mismatch between their assets and their liabilities. Comparable to Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, it, was, it was a little different in this case in that they had very long-dated obligations or pension liabilities. They couldn't match those liabilities in the investment market, so they bought duration in the swap or the derivative market. Mm -hmm. And then when you saw a sharp move in UK interest rates, um, based on inflation concerns that came to arise back in September, all of a sudden these pension funds were subject to margin calls, which they they had to rapidly liquidate assets. Now, most of them had, pretty much all of them had enough liquid assets to meet those margin calls, but I don't think they're, they'd really kind of prepared for themselves for that kind of like two or three standard deviation event. Similarly, um, you look at what happened in, in um, uh, you know, a few weeks ago with the S SVB situation, um, you, you had a lot of people who had hundreds of millions of dollars unguaranteed <laughs> right. deposited with one bank. They should probably never have been doing that. They should probably have always had it either in multiple banks or more likely in a, in a money market fund where you right. have a truly diversified set of risk. So I think it's, it's really not thinking, it, it's thinking through for each client, what's my base case return for their portfolio? What's the base case return for an individual asset within that portfolio? And 
based on like large deviations from norms, as you saw last year, for example, with both bonds and equities going down, can I live to fight another day? Can I live to fight another day? That's, that's the number. Whenever I think about um, you know crises, it, you know number one, two, and three is liquidity. Can I get to the other side? Because if I have enough time, I can dig my way out of a hole. There was a book I don't remember if it was the '30s or or '50s, the Battle for Investment mm-hmm. Survival. Maybe that was Gerald Loeb. Mm. But it's all about what what do I need to do to make sure I could get through this and and still be standing after the storm recedes. Yep, De- dead yeah. on. So. Let's take a look at a day in the life of a CIO responsible for that much capital. Tell us what a typical day is for Julian Salisbury. Uh, It's it's hard to say a typical day, but I could tell you over the course of the week generally how I how I spend my time. I mean, first of all, you know, one of one of the most fun parts of it is is sitting on the investment committees uh, for our private side activities. So we have our private equity committee on a on on a Tuesday, uh, our growth committee on a Monday. Uh, we also do infrastructure on a Tuesday. We do uh, real estate on a on a Wednesday and, and credit on a Thursday. So that's that's kind of like a, a, a central core part of how I spend my time. Uh, really uh, uh, seeing what the teams are bringing through in terms of deals that we're looking at in the early inception of the transaction, as, as well as you know taking these deals all the way through to final approval. Uh, that's on the private side, and then on the public side, really getting market updates uh, from our various. Uh, you know, portfolio managers and, and CIOs across the public side business in terms of what's been happening in those businesses. Um, so that's the kind of more investment side of things. Then there's you know, business reviews going through each of these individual investment units and really looking at their their uh, their, their structure, their resource allocation, their talent, uh, their performance is, is something I spend a lot of time on really dissecting not only what is their performance, but why have they performed the way they've performed, um, both on an absolute and relative basis, both versus benchmark and versus clients. I spend a lot of time either individually one-on-one with people or talking to our different investment teams around talent and cultivating talent and building culture within the businesses. Um, and then there's clients. I spend a great deal of time with clients either on the road, um, a lot of time on the road probably, you know, like 20 to 30% of the time on the road with, with clients. And I always find those just in, incredibly, um, you know, informative meetings, really, really deeply understanding the, the wants and needs of, of our clients. And that, and that certainly helps inform uh, investment judgment and decisions that we're making on, on, on the asset side. Um, and then I would say the, the, the final thing is just, you know, kind of, the, the, from, a, from a strategy perspective, what are the new investment products or investment solutions, whether it's new strategies or different wrappers around existing strategies in order to be able to deliver our um, investment solutions to a broader range of people? So, so many questions to ask. L- let's stay with strategies first. Mm-hmm. So what trends and practice areas have you most excited looking forward uh, 2023 and beyond? Well, when I think about our need for talent in the organization, I think of it as three buckets. There's our client business, our where we're uh, you know, providing solutions and advice to our clients. There's our investment teams, and then there's the operating platform. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we'll come back to that last one in a second because that, that's a critical area of focus for us. I would say from a client perspective, we really see growth across all of our client channels. So we're um, as we grow the business, as we expand the number of clients, and we expand the number of um, offerings and solutions that we're bringing to those clients, we naturally need more client advisors to help support the growth of that business and maintain the level of service and advice that that, that our clients expect. So whether it's our institutional business uh, across pensions and endowments and insurance, whether it's our private wealth advisors where we're adding advisors, or our third-party wealth channel, you know, as we scale and grow the business, there's a general need to have more talent to continue to provide the level of advice and service that we would want. From an investment perspective, you know, we're continually looking at our teams and continually looking at performance and looking to refine uh, our our teams. But, you know, we really uh, find that um, those investing businesses are quite scalable. So it's really, um, as we expand the size of the platform, we do need to add uh, talent in order to help manage an expanding pool of assets, and then on the infrastructure side, I would say there's a you know continual demand and need to invest in technology and operations in order to deliver a better client experience and to continue 
to improve and enhance our already strong risk management capabilities. But, um, you know, that's an area that we've added quite a bit of talent in the last few years. I've had a number of people sitting in that exact seat all say the same thing. I'm going to throw the, their questions at you. Mm-hmm. Finding talent is not only the most important part of their job, it's also the hardest part. Yep. I, is that overstating it or is that a fair? No, it's it's absolutely it's absolutely critical. And it's amazing the difference one person can make. So we, we have a we have a pretty well tried and tested campus recruitment approach. So we're we're going out to schools across uh, across the the nation as well as around the world to find uh, you know the best and, and brightest talent. I would say we've opened up the funnel materially over the last um, you know decade or two to try to expand the size of the uh, of, of the searchable universe essentially to attract mm-hmm. not just the obvious kid who did the finance degree at the obvious finance focused school, but to attract a broader range of talent. I really find that diversity, and I mean I use that term broadly defined, people who come from a variety of different backgrounds, experiences different college degrees can be very useful to bring that 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 range of people into an investment business so we have a tried and tested kind of campus recruitment approach you know in addition to that you know lateral hiring you know while we while we certainly endeavor to bring people in at the campus level and 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 and, and grow them and and uh, help advance them over time to take on more senior positions so that often when somebody leaves there's you know, somebody behind them ready to take on that job, and in some cases, more than one person uh, uh, willing to take that job. You know, we do attract a, la- a lot of lateral talent as well, especially around specific new areas um, that we're that we're growing in. So it's it's really broad based, and look, we're it's it's a constant uh, hiring approach. I mean, in, in a, I think I, I heard some stats the other day that uh, a little over fifty percent of the people at the firm have joined in the last three or four years. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's quite natural and understandable. That's a combination of natural attrition that you have in any business, growth of the business, some acquisitions that we've made. So integrating all of that talent and, and, and integrating, ensuring that there's uh, like a cultural assimilation is really important. Um, but, you know, the other thing that's key is as you're whilst you naturally have people joining and um, and some attrition, is making sure you have a strong core of people who are consistent and have been there for a very, very long time, especially in the asset management business. Because when people give us money to manage, they're giving us money to manage for a very long time. Uh, it's not about a transaction or a trade. So if you look at our core business, you know, we, we have many, you know, uh, hundreds of uh, investment professionals that have been doing this for you know, decades. You, you mentioned lateral hires on new business areas. What sort of sectors and trends are you excited about looking out over the next couple of years? Well, when I think about our need for talent in the organization, I, I think of it as three buckets. There's our client business, our where we're uh, you know, providing solutions and advice to our clients. There's our investment teams, and then there's the operating platform. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we'll come back to that last one in a second because that, that's a critical area of focus for us. I would say from a client perspective, we really see growth across all of our client channels. So we're as we grow the business, as we expand the number of clients, and we expand the number of um, offerings and solutions that we're bringing to those clients, we naturally need more client advisors to help support the growth of that business and maintain the level of service and advice that that, that our clients expect. So whether it's our institutional business uh, across pensions and endowments and insurance, whether it's our private wealth advisors where we're adding advisors, or our third party wealth channel, you know, as we scale and grow the business, there's a general need to have more talent to continue to provide the level of advice and service that we would want. From an investment perspective, you know, we're continually looking at our teams and continually looking at performance and looking to refine uh, our, our, our teams. But, you know, we really uh, find that um, those investing businesses are quite scalable. So it's really, um, as we expand the size of the platform, we do need to add uh, talent in order to help manage an expanding pool of assets, and then on the infrastructure side, I would say there's a you know continual demand and need to invest in technology um, and operations in order to deliver a better client 
experience and to continue to improve and enhance our already strong risk management capabilities. But um, you know that's an area that we've added quite a bit of talent in the last few years. Hmm. Re- really, quite interesting. So, so this has been kind of a funky year. Inflation seems to be coming down. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't know when the Fed's going to be done their rate hiking cycle. How do you look at 2023 from an investment perspective? Do you think, hey, we have to make some wholesale changes, or are you building portfolios where? Hey, that's what happens. The, the market cycle, rates go up and down. You have to have robustness in order to uh, encounter these. I, I think you have to have some consistency to your process, but also uh, have the humility to you know, uh, realize that you need to make adjustments. And every time there's an event in the market, you, you should it should cause you to rethink how you do things, uh, whether it's SVB or the events uh, that we saw in the UK pension system last year. The, these, are, these are opportunities to learn and enhance your process. But I, I don't think this is a, 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 a wholesale shift we're we're in a a higher rate environment obviously for now and while rates will likely start rolling over you know into next year i think i think we're in an environment where the the hurdle rate for making more illiquid investments is is higher so um you've got to be really mindful that you're getting paid enough um for the on a a nominal return basis versus the risk-free rate but I, i don't think this is a major you know shift i mean the way we're looking at the market today is the you know equity markets are fairly fully valued on most metrics that you look at, and therefore you know we view rates as most attractive generally. Credit and is somewhere in the middle, and, and equities is looking like the most stretched. But I, I wouldn't make a you know that that causes you to tilt or lean in terms mm-hmm. of how you adjust your portfolio. But you don't like you know, it's not a radical uh, a radical shift in approach. You know we look at you know people's long we look at it from a long-term investment perspective. What are the long-term goals of the client? And do they have an asset allocation that's going to help them meet those long-term goals? So we start with a strategic asset allocation, but then there could be tilts around that based on the environment. So so you mentioned earlier 2022 was so unusual. Mm -hmm. It was one of the few years that we've seen where both stocks and bonds were down double digits. Mm -hmm. Uh, I recall a lot of people declaring asset allocation is dead, 60-40 is dead. Uh, Everybody has to start over. I'm going to assume you don't you don't buy into no. the world of allocation is over no i mean it was a you know it was a bad year for 6040 that's that's clear uh but you also have to recognize that the speed and nature of that rate hiking is it was pretty unprecedented um by the way it really demonstrated why diversification in, in a portfolio is important because there were other asset classes you could have owned that would have seen better performance commodities mm-hmm. for example had a particularly good year um one one could argue that it was simply you know the difference between mark to market and non mark to market but if you'd had a more uh, a heavier weighting towards privates in your portfolio that would have created a ballast and some consistency to your return but I certainly don't think it's. I certainly don't think it's it's dead. But I do think um, people uh, should think about you know within the sixty forty. For example, is it all public bonds and public credit, or there are there other um, alternative products, private products that can help form that kind of bedrock of the income portion of my portfolio? And similarly on the on the sixty side, it's not just about public equities and being in index. Um, it's are there private equity alternatives that can give me some diversification, exposure to types of assets or industries that I couldn't otherwise get exposure to, um, that you know accrete on a more consistent and persistent basis over time, and don't have quite the you know the day to day volatility that we see in public markets. So, so you mentioned the rate of Fed hikes we've seen is is has been very rapid, mm-hmm. uh, arguably unprecedented. Yeah. How do you look at Fed actions and this rate volatility? How does this affect your outlook um, uh, going out you know, beyond just the next month or quarter? Again, you have to break it down asset class by asset class there, you know, within our macro businesses, within our public uh, markets businesses, you know, plus minus 25 basis points in terms of peak and, and the, the exact month it starts rolling over. It makes a, it makes a, a huge difference and it's something we, we focus on. We have um, you know, a research-based approach. We have a, a, an outlook and a set of expectations. And if 
the reality deviates from those expectations will refine the approach. We have other asset classes that on the face of it should be less sensitive to the day-to-day machinations of the rate market. But when they move as rapidly as they just did, it can have a dramatic effect. So what do I mean by that? You know, I sometimes think as, you know, when you're when you're a micro investor doing private deals, it's like playing a game of chess. If you get the macro wrong, it turns out you were playing chess on the Titanic. You know, you <laughs> you, you were, um, if you, you could have bought the best piece of real estate. Didn't matter. You could have bought the best class B office, you know, 12 months ago uh, and not anticipated the pace of rate hiking that we just saw. And it just repriced the whole asset class. Mm-hmm. So I think um, the approach the focus on on the rate cycle really varies from somewhere like you know our money markets business where differences in duration in how we run that portfolio being plus or minus 10 days can make a huge difference in our returns and performance relative to other money market managers we have other businesses that might appear less rate sensitive or less obviously rate sensitive but then when you have that magnitude of move, they really roll over. Another great example of this, I thought it's kind of funny that, you know, in the growth equity space that, you know, people didn't seem to appreciate the full, how much duration risk they were running. And guess what? When you own a bunch of uh, public assets where all the profitability is 10 years out, that's a long duration asset. So when you have a rate move like that, it, it, it really causes a complete derating. Interesting stuff. You, you've had a pretty busy quarter. You, mm. you cl- announced... Three funds, Horizon, yep. Environment, and Climate Solutions, uh, a private credit fund and a growth equity fund uh, that all closed their rounds, raising more than $22 billion. Mm-hmm. Tell us about those funds and, and what they do and, and how does each slot into a client solution? Well, so taking each of these, our, our growth equity fund really focuses on uh, a couple of different segments, enterprise software, fintech, healthcare and consumer. Those are kind of like the power alleys in terms of industries that they focus on. They're typically making significant but minority investments in fast growing companies. You know, these are companies often with an enterprise value in the area of a couple hundred million to a billion dollars, sometimes skews higher, but I'd say the sweet spot is that area. And the reason for that, these are kind of companies that are growing at least, uh, you know, were growing 50 to 100 percent rates of, uh, of revenue growth where the potential for takeout isn't exclusively an IPO. They're, they could be sold to a, a strategic. And we're trying to help grow these companies over a three to four year period, prepare them for a public exit or a strategic exit. Mm-hmm. And we build a portfolio of these uh, of these businesses and we do that globally. That's our growth equity business. And that's a team that's been, it's a first time fund, but we've been doing it for 30 years, just using our own money. Our, um, our MES fund, this was um, actually the, the eighth in a series of mezzanine funds. We've been private doing this- Private credit? Private mezzanine credit. We've been doing this for decades. Um, and uh, this is really uh, a, a strong power alley for us in as much that, you know, we're, we're, we're tied to the, you know, a preeminent investment bank. We have very close relationships with sponsor clients. This means we're, you know, we're at the, the leading edge. Every time a, a, an asset is going to trade or refinance, we know about it um, because of our investment banking business. And we can position ourselves as the preferred provider of the mezzanine capital to facilitate that transaction. And I would say right now, given uh, what's going on in the world, the rates of return available to us in the private credit markets generally are just unusually attractive. Mm-hmm. So that's our that's our mezzanine credit fund. And then our Horizon Climate Fund is a, this is really more of a private equity style control investments where we're looking to invest in companies that will have a, a positive impact um, on the environment. It's, a, it's an Article 9 fund and it's, it's investing in things like climate, uh, water treatment, recycling, um, and, and these are fast growing companies, uh, but also, um, you know, so th- there's a, there's absolutely, um, these are, these are uh, pools of money that are managed with a, uh, a profit motive, but they're also investing in companies that are having a positive impact on the environment. So let me throw a curveball at you. Yeah. At, at one point in time, you were a aspiring sports scientist and competitive kayaker. Yeah. Uh, what, what's that about? I, I picked up kayaking when I was, um, you know, 11 or 12. I started competing when I was um 
14 or 15, I, I got quite into it. Uh, I took it very seriously. I developed a passion for it. And mm. next thing I know, I'm, I'm in the top division in the country and, and, and competing at the highest level um, internationally. So when, we say, when you say kayaker, we're not talking about the long skulls that we see on the Charles no. River. We're talking about one or two person kayaks. It's, it's a one person kayak. You sit down, you have a double bladed paddle and you go down mm. whitewater rapids and you navigating poles in the river. You have gates that you go downstream through and gates that you go upstream through. Most people only know about it because it's in the Olympics every four years and they forget about it. But it's a, it's a pretty interesting competitive sport. W were you ever good enough to think about the Olympics? I competed at a pretty high level up until the age of uh, 19, uh, up until the age of like around 20, actually, 2021. 20, I was you know, British University champion for a few years and, and, and competed in the top division. But at some point I realized uh, there wasn't a lot of money in that, in that sport. And I didn't like the idea of sleeping in the back of a van, uh, chasing... <laughs> You know, chasing uh, glory around the world for the next five years. Not a lot of money in kayaking. Who, no. Whoever would have guessed. Yeah. I know I only have you for a limited amount of time. Let me jump to my favorite questions that I ask all of my guests, starting with what have you been watching, streaming, listening to lately? What, what's been keeping you entertained? My, my two favorite shows at the moment are Ted Lasso and, and Succession. Uh, very different uh, shows. One oh. one speaks to my interest in in sport, and and the other one is, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a, it's almost a comedy. It's so dis it's such a dysfunctional family. So tell us about your mentors who helped shape your career. You know, there, there's a few people um, along the way. I mean, first of all, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, Goldman Sachs, you're surrounded by great people that you can learn from, um, uh, developing. You know, and that could be technical skills could be leadership skills. Uh, and the other thing I would say is over the years, when, whenever I get asked this question, I think not just about who I've worked for, but the many things that I've learned from the people who work for me. And some, you know, sometimes my level of interaction with them is so great. You can learn a lot from an analyst and you can certainly learn a lot from your, your peers, uh, partners that work for you, managing directors that work for you. So I, 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 whenever I get asked this question, I, I, I sometimes feel like I've almost learned more from the people who work for me than, than the people I work for. But look, there have been some particular um, strong people along the way. I, I remember um, a guy that I used to work for at KPMG. And one year I said to him, um, gee, at the end of the year, and this guy was unreplaceable. I mean, he seemed to be in the middle of every piece of business that we did, and you couldn't imagine how the place would function without him. And I said, you know, at the end of the year, you must be able to ask for whatever you want. And he just looked at me and said, they'd manage. <laughs> and it was it was really like the humility there and, and the realization that everybody's, you know, re replaceable. Some are harder to replace than others, but mm -hmm. he just kept that grounding. And sometimes, sometimes people lose sight of that and believe their own uh, story a little bit too much. That was a great lesson. I had a, uh, when I, after a couple of years at Goldman Sachs, I was working for a guy in the distressed credit business and his analytical rigor and his relentless questioning and skepticism almost to an unhealthy level was actually a great learning experience because he, it was, um, you know, in a world where a lot of people like to believe the, the, the brochure or the prospectus, uh -huh. he never, it, it was, everything had to be founded in analytical rigor and facts, not what management told you or what story you heard. Or Take some nothing anecdote. for granted. It's like, can you prove it in the numbers? I mean, it's back to the comment I made earlier around accounting. We get, we get a lot of kids who come through the business who have fancy MBAs, but they don't truly understand the interactions between a P&L, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. And if you don't have all three, and I mean a complete one, not a partial balance sheet with just the liability structure, mm -hmm. but everything, you don't really understand the business. Huh. Really very intriguing. Let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites? What are you reading right now? Whenever I get asked this question, my, my first response is um, about 25 investment memos every single week. Uh, <laughs> add to that the various other business updates that I get and the prep for management committee on a Monday detailing all of the client flows in the business. It doesn't actually leave a lot of time or eyesight left to, uh, you know, pick up other books. Um, and, you know, with the, uh, with the, with the advent of the, uh, of, of the iPhone, like this constant stream of information from Bloomberg and other news sources means that I'm, I'm, I'm reading a lot, but not a lot enough time for pleasurable books, but th there are a couple. There's, there's a, uh, 
uh, the avoidable war. I think the the the, the geopolitical situation with mm. China is something that everybody should be very mindful of right now, and that's going to uh, that's going to impact asset prices and 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 flow of of money. Um, and uh, I think that's something everybody needs to be paying attention to. Uh, I've I've been um, I uh, picked up a book recently looking at, it's called The Shallows, which is really looking at how the mind is being rewired by the internet. The way we think and the huh. way we operate is fundamentally changing. I mean, you know, everybody's become like, everybody's developing kind of attention deficit disorder because of the constant flow of information and actually the ability to sit down and absorb a long form book is, is becoming harder for a lot of people because they're so used to the instant gratification of the Twitter feed or the, or the short term news story. Yeah, deep work is becoming more and more rare. Yeah. Our final two questions, what sort of advice would you give a recent college grad interested in a career in either investment or finance? I'd say three things. One, don't be put off, as we talked about earlier, by some of the strange language and nomenclature. Become a student of it, study it, and um, break through those barriers, and don't be intimidated by it. Two, I would say, develop an area of expertise early on. And what I mean by that is, in order to start really adding value, you need to prove yourself to be um, really expert or knowledgeable in a particular area, the go-to person on that on that issue, and it could be relatively narrow. So I'll give you an example. I used to be a high-yield research analyst. You, you, know, you, you learn how to model one cable TV uh, company, um, and then you do a second and a third, and then you because of the process that you go through, you start to develop an ability to assess relative value between those things. Mm -hmm. And then you do a fifth and a sixth, and then you become the go-to person. So become a deep expert in that one area, the go-to person. But then you want to start, if you, if you, unless you want to do that for the rest of your career, you need to start adding some, some breadth. But it's, um, it's getting the balance right because you know you can't if you're skipping from one area to another and you never get deep and expert in any one thing, then you become too much of a generalist. So it's getting that balance right between mm. um, specialist skills, uh, but not getting so sucked in that you become siloed and that's the only thing you ever do. Hmm. Really interesting. And our final question: What do you know about the world of investing today? You wish you knew thirty or so years ago when you were first getting started. Yeah. Well, I, I started out in life really doing uh, as a micro analyst, like covering distressed credit situations, and it was always about finding that 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 complicated, weird, interesting deal where you couldn't really lose money, and there was interesting convexity to the upside, and it was all about the art of maximizing risk-adjusted return on that one trade, and, and almost having like a bit of a a dismissive view to people who just put money into like mutual funds and regular equity funds and, and little you know fixed income funds and um you know in sometimes you can get lost in the in, in the wood you know uh, looking uh, you, you can't spot the wood for the trees and just the power of compounding a diversified portfolio over decades has proven to be a highly successful path to wealth maximization so it's really taken a step back from the not just about maximizing the profit on the individual deal, but how do I maximize return on my overall portfolio over a long period of time? My micro and macro. Exactly. Really quite fascinating. Julian, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Julian Salisbury. He is the Chief Investment Officer of Asset and Wealth Management at Goldman Sachs, where he helps to oversee over $2.5 trillion dollars in assets under supervision. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the previous 499 we've done over the past eight years. You can find those at iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Check out the fine family of Bloomberg Podcasts on Twitter at Podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Julian Salisbury and the work he does at Goldman Sachs, go to LinkedIn and look up Julian Salisbury. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps with these conversations each week. Samantha Danzinger is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Sean Russo is my researcher. Paris Wald is our producer. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.